on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. Abraham Lincoln On September 22nd, just five days after the Battle of Antietam, the President issued his Emancipation Proclamation. If my name ever goes into history, Lincoln said, it will be for this act. The South was outraged. Jefferson Davis called it the most execrable measure recorded in the history of guilty man. At a Washington dinner, John Hay, the president's 23-year-old secretary, noted that everyone seemed to feel a new sort of exhilarating life. The president's proclamation had freed them as well as the slaves. It was no longer a question of the union as it was that was to be reestablished. It was the union as it should be, that is to say, washed clean from its original sin. We were no longer merely the soldiers of a political controversy. We were now the missionaries of a great work of redemption, the armed liberators of millions. The war was ennobled. The object was higher. Abroad, the proclamation had the effect Lincoln had hoped for. Neither England nor France was willing openly to oppose a United States pledged to end slavery. The triumph of the Confederacy would be a victory of the powers of evil, which would give courage to the enemies of progress and damp the spirits of friends all over the civilized world. The American Civil War is destined to be a turning point for good or evil of the course of human affairs. John Stuart Mill. Put not your trust in princes, and rest not your hopes on foreign nations. This war is ours. We must fight it out ourselves. Jefferson Davis. That December, Lincoln spoke to Congress. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We say we are for union. The world will not forget that we say this. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. December 31. Well, the year 1862 is drawn to a close, and as I look back, I am bewildered when I think of the hundreds of miles I have tramped, the thousands of dead and wounded that I have seen. But we hope for the best and feel sure that in the end the Union will be restored. Goodbye, 1862. Elijah Hunt Rhodes. We shout for joy that we live to record this righteous decree. Free forever. O oh, ye millions of free and loyal men who have earnestly sought to free your bleeding country from the dreadful ravages of revolution and anarchy, lift up now your voices with joy and thanksgiving, for with freedom to the slave will come peace and safety to your country. Frederick Douglass. 
On December 31st, a large crowd of abolitionists, including Harriet Tubman and Wendell Phillips, gathered together in the Music Hall in Boston. At midnight, the Emancipation Proclamation would take effect. On the stage, William Lloyd Garrison wept with joy beside Frederick Douglass. The cheering crowd called for Harriet Beecher Stowe. She stood in the balcony, tears in her eyes. At a Washington, D.C. contraband camp, former slaves testified. One remembered the sale of his daughter. Now, no more of that, he said. They can't sell my wife and children anymore. Bless the Lord. On the sea islands off South Carolina, federal agents read the proclamation aloud to former slaves under the spreading boughs of a huge oak tree. As the commander of a new all-black regiment unfurled an American flag, his men broke into song. It seemed the choked voice of a race at last unloosed, he wrote. 